we're meeting uh, today uh, at the Hasharon Hotel Herzliya uh, with the uh, Machal pilot George Lichter, Israeli Air Force Major George Lichter, uh, fighter pilot in the American Air Force during the Second World War, 101 uh, first combat squadron of the Israeli Air Force pilot during uh, our War of Independence, instructor of the first uh, fighter pilots of the Israeli Air Force during the uh, War of Independence. Uh, photographers are Sagi Alush and Liran Dassau. Uh, producer, First Lieutenant Yael Weckstein. Interviewers, uh, retired uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ohad Noy. Uh, former combat pilot, now uh, flight instructor in the uh, Air Force Academy and uh, first officer in El Al, and Avi Moshe Segal, uh, head curator, Israeli Air Force Museum, Hatserim. Please, Ohad. Okay, George, uh, since you are a man of present and future, we shall start with the present. Good. What's, what's your impression from, from Israel and from the Air Force, Israeli Air Force, from this recent visit? Well, <coughs> I haven't been here. This is the longest period since I left Israel, I guess, in 1951, that I haven't been back to Israel. I was here uh, for the 50th anniversary, and I came three times, I guess, in 98 uh, and 99, and then I kind of stopped. and. Uh, I stopped because I was enjoying life so much in Boulder, Colorado, but, uh, and I wasn't anxious to come. I really, you know, saw all my friends, and I'm on the telephone pretty regularly with good friends in Israel, but uh, now that I'm here, I'm very glad I'm here, and very happy to see the country, uh, which I expected to be much more depressed than it is. Uh, I'm shocked at the amount of building that I see. Uh, the automobiles, the traffic, and the, and not only automobiles, but up-to-date modern cars and a variety, uh, much more than we have in the States, I think, uh, different cars and so on. And uh, the country is alive and happy, I think, to a large extent, the people I know. Uh, that's the upside. I met a lot of good friends. Uh, Asa Weitzman was nice enough to invite me to his home, and he had Sid Cohen and uh, Boris Senior, also 101 pilots there. We had a wonderful, wonderful afternoon together. Uh, the down part for me was seeing people getting old. <laughs> I didn't like to see that. And I did visit some people in nursing homes and uh, in their own homes. And some people have aged very gracefully and beautifully, and other people. I see getting old, and I don't, I don't enjoy seeing that. I really don't. And uh, I love my life in Boulder, Colorado. But I really believe if my children were here, I would be living here. Uh, I find that if you have enough money to live comfortably, Israel is a beautiful place to live still. And uh, I'm not going to let the terrorists deter me from coming or stop me from running my life. Uh, if we do that, then really the terrorists are winning. And uh, we just got to move on. And I find the people in Israel are doing that, very much so. Uh, my impression of the Air Force is it's like from out of space. It, it's so different than what I remembered. And uh, Hatsarim was beautiful. Uh, we were treated royally. And I always feel uncomfortable. I'm treated so well that uh, people are so good to me that I'm almost ashamed. I don't, I don't feel I deserve it, and I really don't. I'm not looking for compliments. Uh, we didn't do anything that exceptional. We came here, and uh, some of us stayed on for a while, like Boris Senior is still here from 1947, I guess he came, and Sid Cohen went back, became a doctor, and then mm -hmm. came back here. I, I give them a lot of credit. And uh, the Air Force itself is spectacular. I mean, what I saw was just, it was mind-blowing. Uh, it's hard for me to comprehend. Uh, I look at the aircraft, I don't know how they fly. <laughs> it's just amazing to me. 
and the payloads they carry. So that was a great visit, and uh, as I say, uh, I remember having, a, having food at Hutzer and having lunch there with uh, these VIPs from the head of the group, the head of the former head of the Israel Air Force, uh, Bodinger, and the food was wonderful. It was good as a real good restaurant <laughs> anywhere. And I remember the food we had, which was not so good. And, uh, and we experienced Tzena. Uh, I remember one thing when we were living in Jaffa after the war was over, and I, I was flying at Cross Circuit. Um, my former wife, she, she speaks Hebrew fluently. I never did learn. I, the language of the Air Force in those days was all English. And uh, she would get one egg per adult per week, and then the next week she would get two eggs. And when we got the two eggs, we would invite another couple, and we'd sit down and have that one egg each for lunch you know, on Shabbat, and my mouth waters when I think of eggs even. Uh, it was such a luxury to have an egg. And it was a wonderful time in Israel. I, I looked back at it with uh, great joy that people shared everything. Uh, we didn't lock our doors. When we got a package from home, everybody shared. It was like, I didn't get a package. We all got a package, and we shared whatever we got. And it was a great time. It really was. And uh, go ahead. <coughs> you, always, uh, you always mention that uh, you are not deserve this uh, honor no. that uh, you are getting here. Wow. And uh, I wonder what, what, was, or what were your feelings when you came over? What was the reason that you came back in 1948? <coughs> What pushed you to come, and uh, was it a kind of adventure or uh, for a young man or as a Jewish uh, guy, you felt like you had to do something? Could you remember what, what were the motivations that pushed you back then from that uh, warm nest in New York to the Middle East? Uh, I remember very clearly. Uh, first of all, during World War II, I was not aware of the... I knew there were concentration camps, but I was not aware of the Holocaust that we learned about after the war. Uh, after the war, when I saw what happened to the Jews, and then when I saw what was possibly going to happen to the Jews in Israel, I felt the Jews had to stand up and fight. I honestly didn't expect the state of Israel to survive. I really didn't believe that. In fact, I was in business. I told my partners, I'll be home in a month or two. Uh, I didn't expect to get killed, and I didn't go for an adventure. I went because I knew we had to fight, and if I could help, I wanted to help. And I, didn't, I wasn't married. I didn't have children. Uh, I was in business with two partners, and I felt I, I could take off for a couple of months. Well, a couple of months extended into a long period, but... Uh, and shockingly, I had no idea of what Israel was like. And I always thought there were only about 500,000, but I, I later heard there were 600,000 Jews in Israel. Could, could, you remember, could you remember who was your uh, focal point, who was your contact point, who fi found you in New York and you know, uh, asked you, could you join? Uh, the story is really too long to go into detail, but. I didn't know who to contact, so, uh, and I, I was not really, I was not a re religious Jew of any kind, I knew I was Jewish. Uh, my parents kept a kosher home, but it was out of respect for my grandparents, and when we went out, we ate anything we wanted. But um, when the war came along, and I knew there was going to be a war, I, I, I went and I called um, every Jewish organization I could think of. I even called the local synagogue, and I called, uh, I think, the Hayas, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, uh, maybe the Zionist uh, Organization of America, and I said that I was a pilot and I would like to go and help out in Israel if they could use me. And nobody said they knew anything. They didn't know who or what, and uh, within two or three days I got a call, and it was all sort of uh, very cloak and daggerish. Uh, I had to meet some people at the Bristol Hotel in New York, which is still exists. It's not a hotel anymore, but it's on 29th Street and Broadway, and uh, bring my logbook and uh, credentials. And uh, I met there in a room with two people. I don't even remember their names. 
and they asked me when I was ready to go, and I said I, I could go any time. I had a passport, but I had to renew it. In those days, you had a passport, I think, for three years, and you renewed it for two or something like that. And I said I could go down to Washington and get it renewed, which I did. I made a trip, a business trip quickly to Baltimore and Washington, renewed my passport. And I, I was contacted again and told to go to a, an office and I don't remember the name of the office, but it was on 40th Street and 5th Avenue. And they gave me a ticket, a one-way ticket, uh, to Geneva, Switzerland. And they gave me the name of a person and a telephone number on a piece of paper, which they told me to memorize. I shouldn't even keep the paper. The telephone number, I don't remember. The name I remember it was Rami Tiber. I understand his family is in the insurance business. I have never met him since then, but I flew to, Ge and I was wondering what happens if I get to Geneva and there's no Rami Taiba or the telephone is disconnected. They, they didn't, said, don't worry about it. Well, I worried a little bit, but I flew over to Geneva and called and Rami Taiba came over. Oh, and they, they also asked me how much money I wanted and I told them I didn't need any money. I was single and uh, and they said, well, don't you have expenses? I said, no, I don't have expenses. They said, well, what about insurance? I said, yeah, I have insurance policy. But so would $100 a month be okay? I said, wonderful, that's fine. That'll more than cover me. And with that, they, they gave me, I believe it was $100 expense money also and told me. Then I took some money of my own, of course, and uh, met Robbie Tiber. He, I called him from the airport, I guess. He told me to check into the Monopole Hotel, either Monopole or Metropole, I'm not sure. It was on Lac Le Man and beautiful. And he came and met me there and uh, gave me some Swiss francs and told me to buy a ticket to Zurich and from Zurich to buy a plane ticket to Prague. And I told him my passport doesn't allow me to go to any iron country, curtain country, not uh, Czechoslovakia or Romania, Communist Hungary, Russia, none of that. Country. And he said, don't worry, don't worry, they, they'll give you a separate piece of paper, they won't stamp your passport. So I took a train to Zurich, I'm cutting it a little short, then uh, flew in a DC-3, Czech, Czech Airlines, and uh, that, and he said, there you will meet a Dr. Felix, we'll meet you at the airport. And it was, he was the important guy. I, I got the feeling that he was like the key to everything. And when I got to the airport, there were only about, it's too, it's too, was it too loud? I believe there were only 15, maybe 15, 20 passengers. And I'm waiting and looking around, where's Dr. Felix? And when I got there, it was about 11.30 at night, maybe midnight. And it was really dreary compared to Switzerland or the United States, the airport was ugly and dreary and dark and there were people walking around with guns in their hands and uh, I wasn't very comfortable and everybody was getting in line to bring their passports and I was waiting. Finally everybody went through and I was all alone and no Dr. Felix I could and nobody approached me and I really was nervous but finally a, uh, a young Czech airline hostess came over a ground hostess, I guess, and she asked me if I was waiting for Dr. Felix. I said, yes. Well, he can't make it, but he told me to help you. Give me your passport, blah, 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 come and follow me. So I, she spoke pretty good English, and I went, and they looked at my passport, and they stamped it. And I thought, boy, they're going to get me now when I go back to the States. I now have a Czechoslovakian visa in my passport. And she said, and she took me through customs, and she said, go to the Palace Hotel where you, Dr. Felix is and check in there. And I said, I have no check money. Where could I cash the money? She said, don't worry. She paid the driver. And uh, he took me to the hotel and I called Dr. Felix. He was obviously, by this time it was maybe one o'clock in the morning and he said, I'll see you in the morning at breakfast. And that's where I met Boris Senior and uh, Chris McGee and Rudy Ogarten. Uh, and we were all going, I found out later, to uh, Chesky Bujovica to check out uh, with ME-109s. 
But before I left from the States, they asked me what I flew, and I told them I flew Thunderbolt and Mustangs in World War II and P-40. And they said, oh, that's great. That's what we have. <laughs> <laughs> Only so they were. <laughs> I, I was really kind of shocked. But, and uh, Because in World War II, I shot down an ME-109 and fought against them. And these ME-109s were terrible. They, it was the worst plane I ever flew in my life. Uh, to this day, I don't know how we got away with it, flying against the Egyptians and what, uh, though, that was that. At any rate, uh, when they found out I was a, a fighter pilot and also an instructor, I had instructors rating, they asked me to stay on in Czechoslovakia and train the, the groups that were coming through after our group. And I don't know how many hours, maybe six or eight, five hours, six hours, seven hours, we got an ME 109s and then the rest of them left and I stayed. There uh -huh. was a truce on in Israel. I think it was the first truce, July, June or July. Yes. And I said I would stay, but when the truce was over, I wanted to go back. So I took care of one or two courses. Uh, Leo Nomis came through me and Mike Flint, and I can't remember the names of some of the other guys. And uh, the next thing I knew, the truce was over, and I demanded to go back, go to Israel. And I went with uh, C-54, and they had, you know, machine guns and parts of airplanes in there. And Arnie Yellowwhite uh, was the captain. He died a few years ago, an American. And I arrived in Israel, and they took me to Kvash Mariahu, where they were billeted in a pension, fork house. Only they didn't have any room for me. So they roomed me in a private home. I got a bedroom, which I shared with Leo Novus. And I joined the squadron. And uh, met Aza and uh, Rudy Ogarten and uh, Sid Cohen and uh, Cyril Horowitz. And a lot of guys who were no longer around, like Cyril. Uh, Jack Cohn was in Melbourne, mm -hmm. Australia. Mm -hmm. And I flew here for a while. I never saw an enemy aircraft. I mean, we flew, we did uh, photo reconnaissance missions, we did all sorts of things, but I really never got into a dogfight while I was here. Okay, is there anything else you want yes, to Yes, and then, there? after a while, you were asked to go back to Czechoslovakia. Uh, the first trip back to Czechoslovakia, I think, was in, and I you know, always check with uh, Danny Shapiro or Mayor Roof or Tibi Ben Shaha. Uh, Mutti Hud was with this group, but they asked me to go back to Czechoslovakia and take over and train some of the Israeli boys. It was a group, there were 13 of them. Among them was one Frenchman, Rene Levy, and he was the only one we washed out. We, he claimed that he was a pilot, but he was the pilot, and uh, he was terrible. That's separate stories. Their stories have stories all yeah, the time. Right. And, uh, I flew with the Israeli boys, and by this time they only had about a hundred hours, and uh, mostly, I guess, with the Czech Air Force training, and they asked us to train them in ME-109s, but it was dual control, so we didn't let them go solo. Uh, none of them went solo in the ME-109s, but they also said if you could check out anybody in the Spitfire, by that time they had some Spitfires. And I selected, I think, only four of them. Danny Shapiro was first, and Mutti Hud, and Shaya Gazit. They all had different, most of them had different names. And Mutti Hud was Mutti Fine. Fine. He was from the Ganya. And uh, Shaya Gazit was Shaya Schwartzman. And Tibi Ben Shacha was Tibi Stern. Danny Shapiro is the only one who still <laughs> has the same name. <coughs> so they were, and uh, we had Meir Ruf and uh, Avram Yafi and I can't remember all the names, it's unfortunate, but uh, you can always get that from the archives. Okay, now we are coming to the end, actually, of, of an era when the Czechs didn't want us to stay in Czechoslovakia anymore, and start, started to show you the way out, and you had to, to take all the Spitfires and move them out in what we know today to be as Vilveta II. Could you, as a leader of this uh, operation, could you tell a little bit about this operation? Well, first I'll say that uh, 
it started with getting the boys out, the Israeli boys, and I think that was September or something. Yeah, maybe let's think on that. First no, of all, you uh, say you it started really with getting the boys out, the Israeli boys, uh, Mutti, Tibi, Shai, and so on, out of Czechoslovakia. They were afraid they were going to keep them behind. And so I got, we got out, we flew for a couple of weeks, I guess, in Chesky Budjavica, and then they got us out of Czechoslovakia back here, and I rejoined 101. Again, within a short time, they wanted me to go back and work with Sam Pomerantz. I was not the leader of Velveta II. Sam Pomerantz was the leader, and he was a wonderful, incredible human being. He was a pilot. He was also an engineer, I believe. And uh, the plan was, I guess, to take 12 of them over, and we were testing them first. It was just he and me and uh, nobody else, really. And we, every day we were flying these things and getting, testing them, how much fuel we could get into them. <laughs> And he took everything out of him. He took, you know, all the armament, all the uh, ammo, and even the armor plating, and uh, put in uh, fuel sure. tanks. The Spitfire, I think, normally only had a range of about an hour and a half. And it was a, an interceptor used very successfully in England in World War II. And we were going to try to fly it all the way nonstop to Israel because we weren't sure we could land in Yugoslavia. I'm not sure we would have made it nonstop to this day. We'll never know. But even with a flight to, from Czechoslovakia to Yugoslavia and then from Yugoslavia to Israel, it was long. And for a Spitfire, it was, he and I were the only ones who had radios. And then we started bringing men in. We got the planes ready and we started bringing the men in from Israel. And we didn't have enough people that they could spare who were fighter pilots who could fly the Spitfire, who knew anything about it. And they asked me if any of the students were capable, and I selected Mutti Hood and Danny Shapiro. And they flew on my wing. And uh, the first time we went off was a few days uh, before we got here. Uh, and we got into a, it was a terrible snowstorm. And uh, we got up to about 14, maybe 15,000 feet. We didn't have any oxygen. And Sam and I were the only ones with radio, so we couldn't communicate with anyone else. And he said, what should we do? I said, we got to go back. I mean, we didn't see daylight. We're up at 15,000 feet, and pretty soon we'll run out of oxygen and we'll, we'll all crash. And he said, why don't you take the, the group back, and I'll try to go ahead. Why he wanted to go ahead, I don't know. I mean... We'll never know, really. He was anxious to go and uh, try to get go through. And uh, we later learned he crashed into a mountain or something and got killed. And uh, I came back. I brought the boys back. And they all, it was all, you know, waggling the wings in formation. And Mutti and Danny were, you know, they, they were beginners. They really weren't very good at it. But they stuck with me. And uh, to find the field, because we were gone a good hour or more, and in cloud the whole time, and we came down right over the center of the field. It was luck. Don't, uh, <laughs> I don't attribute it to my skill at all. We just happened to hit it, and it was covered with it snow. It was all snowy, yeah? A dirt field. It was not easy to find, but we found the field. And I guess it was a day or two later we took off, and uh, in that flight we lost... Danny Shapiro got lost a little bit, and, he always, and we looked for him. We did some S-turns, and we finally got him. He was just ready to bail out. He has the story about that that he can tell you. And what we did was, it was all dead reckoning. We didn't have radio contact with Yugoslavia. We didn't have, uh, it's, we had needle ball, airspeed, uh, you know, very little else in the airplane. And dead reckoning, we were in cloud most of the time. And I, uh, you know, reckoned that we were well over the Adriatic Sea. And I let down, I think we broke surface and into, broke cloud at about 300 feet. Oh, really? And we came over the water. And I <coughs> headed a little bit what I felt was south of where the airfield was to hit the coast, came up the coast, and hit the airfield again right down the center. And again, it was like a miracle. Believe me, I, I, I am not. I'm not that good, and nobody's that good <laughs> to be able to do that. But uh, somebody was watching over us. And I don't even believe in God, but maybe I'm beginning to think maybe, maybe there's some, something. 
and we landed there and it was primitive it was you know it was a, a dry lake bed i guess and get a shohat the late get a shohat who i loved he was the commander there and uh, we actually slept underground only i think only one night maybe two and i remember in the morning to wash up they had a barrel they had a barrel of water and the top of the water was frozen and it was December. I don't remember the exact date again. That's yeah, it's twenty twenty second of December. It was yeah. just before Christmas, and we flew in. They had a mother ship that we followed, a C forty six, I believe it was, and we followed them. And we just had enough gas, barely, to get to Israel, and fortunately we made it. And uh, we joined the squadron. By that time, the squadron had moved. While I was in Czechoslovakia, they moved to Pristina. And then I flew with the squadron, I joined the squadron, I room, I remember in, a miss, in a, one of the huts with Boris Senior, and one day they shot down like six RAF planes, and I was up, I flew two or three times that day, I never saw a plane, never saw another <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> That was the luck of the draw. Just the luck, but, yeah. Uh, everybody was crazy with joy that they had done this. I was, I was <laughs> a little nervous about the fact that we shot down. Yeah, later, later on they knew it, it, uh, these were British, British airplanes and uh, yeah. they were quite frightened actually in yeah, the, the squadron. I was plenty nervous about yeah. what England would do and so on. And that was uh, I guess January. Exactly, and 7th then, uh, of January. February I, I got permission to leave. I guess the war was just about over. And I had made a deal with the driver of the, our driver in Czechoslovakia who was attached to the Israel Embassy in Prague. He asked me to do him a favor, and the favor was to marry his cousin to get her out of Czechoslovakia. That's how I got married. I didn't even know her. So I flew back to Czechoslovakia, married the girl, and uh, Ehud Avriel was the ambassador. Mm -hmm. And he was a wonderful man. And he actually threw the wedding for us. I didn't ask him to do it, but he, he took care of it. I thought I was going to pay for it, but uh, whatever the cost was, he paid for the reception. We were married in town hall, and uh, supposedly we were supposed to get divorced, but we didn't. We had three children. Uh, I went back to the United States, and I'm making it a little brief than it, could, than it should yeah, be. Okay. But, <laughs> uh, I went back to the United States, sold my business, and decided I wanted to come back. And I told him I was going to come back to Israel. But I had to get my wife out of Czechoslovakia, which I did. And uh, I got back to the United States in March. And uh, by May or Ju June, I came back to Israel. But through Paris, they sent me, it was on a Air Alaska freighter. And I went with Heyman Shamir's wife, the late Heyman Shamir, she's still around, Lorraine Shamir. Uh, his name used to be Shechtman, he was American from yeah. Chicago. And a lovely man, he was Aharon Remez's deputy. deputy. And I want to say something about Aharon Remez. Sure. Uh, he was the commander, of, he was only, a, I think, a sergeant pilot in the Canadian Air Force, they say. He was a wonderful, wonderful human being. I've met a lot of people in my life. I'm going to be 82 next month. But I will tell you, Remus was one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. He was well-read, he was well-schooled, and we remained friends until the day he died. And he was a great commander. When you consider what he did with nothing, and Heyman Shamir and those guys, and Al Swimmer was part of it, but I didn't know him well then. He was with. Um, air transport, they did a wonderful job, an amazing job. Anyway, I came back and I joined 101 Squadron, who, who was in Ramat David then, and they were flying P-51, a Mustang, and I had flown it in World War II, and uh, Aza was the commander, and he says, you flew it before, go fly. I mean, I hadn't <laughs> flown it since 1945, and it was now 1949. But uh, I sat in the plane for, <laughs> I was plenty, I, I wanted to, I, I didn't remember the plane that much, but I, I sat in there for about an hour, and I learned, you know, the instruments all over, and I started it up, and I flew. And that was it, but I didn't feel I was doing much good in Ramat David, and I didn't feel I was being utilized. Uh, he, they didn't even let me live in the base with my wife. I lived in Fabaruch 
you know, one room of a farmer's house, and it was primitive, and it was sad. My wife was all alone when I was flying, and any time I flew, they had to send a jeep to get me, and they had a, it, it was not good. So I went to Rebbe's, and I told him that I wasn't being used, and if he could find a place somewhere else where they could use me, and the first thing he did was he sent me to Ekron, and I became a test pilot there for the planes that they were putting through. Uh, and then uh, they opened up, I guess, Kfar Circuit, and they asked me, to, and I went to Kfar Circuit and in charge of the advanced flying school. And uh, Benjamin Bonet was the commander of the base, and then Geda Shochat became commander. And we really put together a very good school. We had the Stearmans for the primary school. Yeah. And by this time, uh, I guess uh, Shia became an instructor in Stearmans, and Tibby was an instructor. We had Harvard's 1860s. Harvard and uh, we had some wonderful students. Uh, among them was Hugo Marom. The Czech boys were excellent. And who was the one um, who was the air attaché that was murdered in Washington? Uh, Joe Plachik. Joe Plachik, and he Joe changed Alon, his name, yeah. but Joe Alone, right. Joe Plachik was, they were very good. Hugo Marone was so good that I, I had to be on my toes to teach him, let me tell you. And that was true <coughs> with Plachik also. And when Plachik was murdered in the States, the FBI investigated me more than once, but they investigated me when I came back from Israel and uh, they took away my passport, and I couldn't get a new passport for a while. Uh, but they never prosecuted me. I thought they might, but uh, they never did. And uh, let's see, where am I? Where, at uh, Plus Circuit? It, is, it, is it the place where you get to know Geta Shochot and became friends? I knew Geta in Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia too. When we first met there, and he was working, he was a beautiful person. He, was a kibbutznik from Kvagila D, and uh, uh, women loved him. Everybody, <laughs> let me tell you, he had women all over Czechoslovakia. <laughs> and uh, he was traveling with false papers. I think he had a Canadian passport. And he was dealing, he, he was carrying around tens of thousands, maybe $100,000 or more, which was a lot of money bribing people and whatnot, and yet he would share a room with me to save money. That's the kind of guy he was. I loved him. He was, he was just a great guy. And we kept in touch all through the years, and I went to visit him in Fagula D years later. And, and you got this statue of, of his head that you yes, got Yes, then the uh, Avram Portugali, uh, who was also a pilot, but I really didn't know him in, in the war. I and also him. from Fagula D, basically. Yeah. The and, oldest pilot of the Israeli Air Force once. Right, and he was a lovely person. He became a sculptor, self-taught sculptor. And they moved to Magan Michael. And there he sculpted. And I came there once, and I saw these three busts that he did of Geda Shochet. They were in clay. And I said, I would love to have one of those. And. He says, I, you, it costs a lot of money to cast it. I says, I will pay for it. Get it. He says, which one do you want? One was the getter that, who showed his face to the world, was really happy, happy, happy. And the other was the real getter. And the third one was like, uh, I don't know, it was, it was three different busts of getter, and I wanted the serious, the true getter. And that's, and he had it cast in Jerusalem. I paid for everything. And somehow, some El Al pilot, I don't remember who, brought it to New York for me. And I had it in my office for many, many years. And then, was it you? I was the guy you who were the took guy it. You took yeah. it back here. Yeah. And it was heavy. And it was heavy. Uh, we, I felt it belonged here. My children didn't know Geta. And uh, I didn't feel it belonged in my office or my apartment in New York. And, Thank heavens they put it in the Air Force Museum. And you still I'm keeping it today. Yeah. And you still have more works of uh, Aaron Remes at your apartment uh, in yes, New York. I Could you tell us about this Aaron side of Remes. Remes that we all don't know actually? Uh, Remes changed careers. It, it was like the seven year itch, only I think he did his in five years. People's lives, if you look at a seven year, seven, fourteen, twenty one 
people's careers changed their life, and he decided, though, in his life to change careers. And every five years or so, he changed careers. He was the head of the Ports Authority here, which is a major job. I never realized what a big job it was, including, uh, which was then Lydda Airport, Ben Gurion Airport. He, example, who knows, how do you unload a cargo of cement? Of, how do you unload a cargo of molasses, liquid? You know, things like that. He t and, and of course, the Port Authority and dock workers all over mm -hmm, the world mm -hmm. are tough to deal with. You have a lot of strikes. But that was one of his things. Then he was... Uh, ambassador to, to London? He was the ambassador to London during the 67 war, I remember, and I visited him there. He was always a good friend. And I think he did a, he was also the head of uh, foreign aid to Africa at one point. And, and then there extreme. were the, the, the sad years of his that nobody actually noticed, noticed him. No, nobody and paid attention. He quit the Knesset, and again, he quit on a matter of conscience. He said, if I can't vote the way I want to, and I have to vote the party line, I quit. And he quit. He was the first one. Aza said that to me years later. He says, if, if they don't make peace when they are having the Mar Madrid thing, I'm going to quit. And he quit. And I give a lot of credit to Aza also. Aza went back and forth in mm -hmm. his career <laughs> from being a real right wing. He was right hand man of Begin, right wing. And then I think when his son Shaul got shot and survived, Aza changed. And I think he became much more of a peace moving person. And now he's back, he likes Sharon. Which he I likes don't, Sharon today? Yeah, I'm, I'm shocked. I mean, I, it's unbelievable. Uh, About the leadership of Modi alone. Uh, I thought he was wonderful. He was very quiet, but, and reserved. And I liked his wife, Mina, unfortunately. She was pregnant, I think, when he died. And I thought he did a wonderful job. He was really a wonderful commander and uh, took care of his men properly and he scheduled everything properly and he ran a squadron. I don't know what his background was. I know he's a pilot, but he certainly was the commander. The, no Israeli during World War II, I got into that position. The British wouldn't allow that. But he sure commanded that squadron. And, you know, it was more than just the pilots. He had maintenance crews. He had a... Uh, cooking, he had all the supplies, he had everything to do under his head, but he did it, and he did it all. Without any heritage, not no anything background. before. None no of background. us had a background. That's why when people were critical of Aharon Remmers, I said, I can do better, you can do better, schmuck. What have we got? This man is doing a great job. Look, look what we have from nothing. I was, it was stunning what we had. And to be able, I, I, I told you at the beginning, I never thought Israel would win. I thought we'd lose, but we're going to go down fighting. And I told my partners, I had two partners, who, two Jewish boys who I, I want to vomit when I think about them, but uh, they were terrible. They were not nice. They were not good Jews. And they wanted me to come home right away. I, t I thought I'd be home in one or two months tops. <laughs> I didn't think, you know, when you think it was 600,000 Jews here total. And that, I think, is stretching, and I think there were less. But say 600,000 Jews, surrounded by like 100 million Arabs or what? Everybody attacking from all sides, and we had nothing. Nothing. And yet we overcame. Absolutely nothing. We had wonderful people. The wonderful society, which I was never aware of. You know, I really didn't know anything Back about it. Back then, you were not aware of it. Not at all. Not at all. But once you came, you, you felt some the atmosphere here, which was, like you say today, when you are coming, you have so many friends. The atmosphere is not so depressed that you might expect. Not at all. I have more friends here, believe me, many more. I feel close and good friends that I have in the United States where I was born and brought up. And uh, the country is beautiful. Look what we have here. Look at the scene. From my room, you see Tel Aviv, you see the, the sea. I'd like to remind you when I first met you some eight years ago or so, and uh, you were living there in New York back then, and you told me, and, and I got the impression that you really didn't thought that what you made, and also when you, 
we listen to you, you don't think it was a great thing to do. And you don't deserve anything, and you don't, uh, you don't, the, we are not owing you anything. And that was the, the spirit of the feeling that I got from you. And then I asked you because I, I thought, well, maybe I'm mistaken. I, I think this man uh, made uh, a history in, here in Israel, but this man doesn't even acknowledge it. His uh, children maybe even don't know about what he was doing here back then. But I ask you now, listen, if, if there is a war now between Israel and the States, whom would you fly for? And you said I would fly for Israel. I said that. Remember right. that? Because Israel is my home. Uh, Israel is my people. Yeah. And I don't feel as comfortable in the United States. And I'm, ah, I'm sad in a way None of my, my children were all brought up Jewish. My wife was half Jewish, but the wrong half, her father, and yeah. he was killed at a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a regret, it's a sadness, but that none of my children married Jewish boys or girls, and uh, my grandchildren have no religion, so there won't be Jews in yeah. my family, yeah. in my close family. It's, <laughs> and it saddens me a little, because, but they all know their heritage. All my children know, and my ex-wife, who never converted fully, but if you ask her who she is, she's Jewish, and she knows it. And she speaks Hebrew, and she loves Israel, and uh, she didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave either, truthfully, but I felt I had to take a chance and uh, go back and see if I could survive in business. But one, one of your kids came over to study for a year or so. Yeah, more than a year he was here, and he speaks Beautiful Hebrew. Really? Tell me he speaks Hebrew better. Boris says he speaks better than him, and Boris has been here for 50 for, years. Yeah. Uh, his Hebrew is wonderful. He took all his courses in Hebrew, uh, but he's never come back. And it's bothered me a lot, but I, I leave my children alone. I don't tell them what to do, but when mm -hmm. I go home... <laughs> do you have any books or photos from those days that your kids could could see and see that you were a pilot here, that you yeah, they, were a kind of a band of, of pilots from all over the world coming uh, over to fly for the state of Israel. Do, I have some photographs. You have some certainly. photographs? Oh, sure. If not, uh, I should no. come with my books <laughs> and show your kids, you no, know? No, the kids, uh, they have a good idea. For my 80th birthday, which was two years ago in December, I'll be 82 this December, they collected, without me knowing, they collected from my former students, from Cuba Marom and Tibi and uh, Shaya and, and Moti, Moti, which and, was still alive, and yeah. everybody in Israel. They called Israel and they got them to send photographs and letters and so on. And they made an album for me about my life. Oh, really? And I have that at home. And believe it or not, after after the album was they presented to me, and that was a shock. I mean, that was the best part of my birthday. I knew I was having a birthday party. But uh, they, they did it with such class, and they did it so beautifully. And unfortunately, when you come to Boulder, you'll see I still have the album. It sits on my dining room table, and I got about 100 pictures more that came after that, oh, really? I, didn't, that I didn't put in yet. <laughs> and it's two years, and everybody's yelling at me. I said, I don't want, it's like I don't want to finish it. Yeah. Then my life will be over. <laughs> I don't know. No, it's just because you're a man of the future, not of the past. Um, uh, so, yeah. I always had to do everything to perfection, but no more. Now I'm a slob. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was about 1953, and then we flew over a PBY, and I went as co-pilot. As There were three pilots. Leo Gardner was the captain, though, and Norman Cohen was one of the co-pilots, and I was the other one. And we flew a PBY from New York to Gander. We were supposed to fly to the Azores, but the weather, uh, there was a, an airline fuel strike and we couldn't get fuel there. So we flew to Gander and we'd go to the northern route. But I was, it was November and I was dressed in summer clothes, figuring I'm coming to Israel. It's not cold in November. All I had was summer clothes and we landed in a storm like you wouldn't believe, snow all over the place. And then we went to Iceland and Shannon and then Rome, and then it took us five days, but it was a wonderful trip, and uh, I remembered it very so well. So you were bringing the Catalina? No I said, I don't, I don't want any pay, I just want the trip. 
And I went and they gave me, a, you know, a ticket back. And so you were bringing the Catalina to Israel? Yeah, one of them. Oh, now I understand how did you get here. <coughs> now, uh, you have many friends here and you yeah. used to arrive nearly every year. Every year. So at least all, once. all the time okay. you met your friends here and and mm -hmm. still like still today yeah we kept Sidcoin was not here but boris was here Sid Cohen i saw yeah in 64 he came back so yeah. he was not oh, here yeah. for, uh, for quite years. a while yeah yeah but i used to see cyril and, Hurl and you had all your alive. students here. yeah i and remember that when you came three years nice. ago when you came three years ago uh, a day after you arrive uh, danny shapira yeah. arrived to to say shalom yeah, he was here too this yeah. trip he was leaving for the states but he came here before he left and we had i forget we had lunch or something together we had bite just one for for my uh, interest one more story about how how did you uh, decide to to be a pilot just <coughs> i always i wanted to be a pilot you wanted when, to be when a pilot? i was a child i was making model airplanes and i loved flying and i went up my father got me a ride I think it was two or three dollars in an open cockpit plane. I sat on his lap. I was maybe 10 years old and I loved it. I loved going <laughs> on roller coasters. And, uh, and I was going to college for one reason. I wanted two years so I could, you needed two years of college to get into the cadets. And my parents, when they knew that's why I was going to college, after one year, they didn't want me to go. And they said, we need you. We can't afford to send you. And I was working my way. I paid. Five hundred dollars a year for college. A year, not for a semester. I had a partial scholarship in music. I used to play music, and I played in the band and the orchestra. And they, but then the war broke out, and I immediately, you know, signed up for flying cadets. And luckily, I was able to pass and go through. But it used to be two years. And they, when the war broke out, they needed pilots, so they changed it to nine months. But they packed two years into nine months, and boy, we worked. And to show you the difference, so we had about 230 or 240 hours of flying before we got into a fighter. And the first fighter we got into was a P-40. That was like transition. Yeah. But only we got about eight or 10 hours, those who were selected to be fighter pilots. And then, um, and then, you went into, then I went into a Thunderbolts, P-47. But the Israeli cadets, they only had about 100 hours. And it was remarkable that even only that four of them could check out the Spitfire after 100 hours, 120 hours, whatever. Remarkable, they did a, a great job, they really did. And the school here, the original school in Fasirkin, was built on the American and British and South African system. We tried to get the best from all systems and build it in. And we did build in a good school, and I, of course it's gotten better and better and better. And now you got a great Air Force, probably the best Air Force of its size in the world, bar none, man for man. <laughs> what, uh, what kind of experience did you have during World War II? What oh, were I, the stages of World War II for you? Well, first let me just say one other thing. You asked me about the, uh, uh, the FBI when Joe Plotchik was killed. 1973. The FBI came and interviewed me again. Oh, uh, really? Why? Why? Because he had an address book with my address in it and my name. How did you know him? Why did he have your address? They were checking anybody that might have a clue to who could have killed him. They didn't know who I was, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they checked every name and address in his book. And they told me when they interviewed me, and I told them, by that time I didn't care anymore. And I told him that he was one of my students, and we were friends. And uh, and I said, "Do you think you'll ever catch these guys?" He says, "No, they were they're professional killers. We know, we're, we're quite certain we know who they are. But they're so professional that by the time it's over and it's in the newspapers, they're they're out of the country and uh -huh. we're gone." So they said, "We we're sure we know who did it, but I'm sorry to tell you that I doubt if we'll ever be able to get them." Tell us a little bit about your World War II experience. Uh, World War II, uh, the cadet training was extremely difficult. And we worked 
like you would, I guess it was six or eight weeks that we didn't even have a single day off. And we worked very hard at it, we really did. But then, uh, then we got our wings and we were assigned to squadrons and I was assigned to a P Thunderbolt squadron that were based in uh, a group actually. There are three squadrons in a group and 16 airplanes per squadron, but 30 pilots. So you had backup crews all the time. You couldn't fly every day. And that was in Richmond, Virginia, where we did transition on the Thunderbolt, and we flew around there. Then we were moved to Washington, D.C., which was uh, an air base called Camp Springs Army Air Base. That is now Andrews Field. They renamed it. it was, we were the first group there, and we were supposed to be Air Defense of Washington. And, and we also, from there, although we had gunnery school as cadets, they now sent us to a gunnery school in Millville, New Jersey. So we would go a squadron at a time. Two squadrons would remain in Washington, one squadron would go to Millville. When they came back, another yeah. squadron. And we did some really crazy things. Uh, I'll tell you several, a couple of stories. You have time for all this. It's, uh, one of the things that I did with one of my friends was I buzzed New York in a Thunderbolt, two Thunderbolts, and we made up, we were going to shoot aerial gunnery, the two of us, with camera guns. So we shot our thing in like three minutes, and then we, we were up around 20, 25,000 feet, and we went in a slow descent to, to New York, and I said, I'm gonna show you New York. We decided this before we left, and he called me Percival, and I called him Throckmorton. He made up the names. And we went, and we came in over the ocean. I said, now we're going to come into Coney Island. And it was in the summer, the summer of 43. And there were like a million people on the beach. And we were so low to the ground that we were whipping up water from Whip our from prop wash. And we came in, and we both went up, and we rolled <laughs> in opposite directions. And then we came around again. and. and I followed down like Ocean Parkway. I said, now, this is a parkway, and I went by my mother's house, and I was maybe as high as that pole there, you know. Really, and what a roar that makes, going about 400 miles an hour. My mother recognized the insignia on the plane. Air Defense of New York never caught us. The next day, oh, and I showed him the Statue of Liberty looking up. We were so low, we were looking up at it. We, we wanted to do, but I got cold feet. I said, we're going to do a loop around the George Washington Bridge. That's what I really wanted to fly <laughs> under and loop around. But we didn't do it. The, the next day, they had a group meeting, and the, and the commander, Curly, comes, and he says, there were two jerks who, who buzzed New York yesterday, and I think they might have been from us, but they don't know who it is, and they never got the numbers, but they were two Thunderbolts, and if we catch them, it would have been caught, my, so we would have been finished. So stupid. And one other story about it that I think is important, that it's like God watches over you or something watches over you. We had an AT-6 that we used for instrument flying to play with. And the, the pilot who was practicing had a hood. They pulled over his head in the back seat. The, the front guy was the observer. Uh -huh. So we had an AT-6, and I was buddies with many guys, but in the Army and the cadets, you went by alphabetical order. So it was Lewis, Lichter, Little, Lind, Millard, and so on. And Lind was my closest buddy, the sweetest guy in the world, and Millard was a buddy. And the three of us were going to go to town, so they offered us the plane. But there's only a two-seater, so we flipped the coin, and I lost. So I went to Washington, and I told them, I'll meet him at the 400 Club, which was a club we used to hang out, a bar, and a place to pick up women. <laughs> And that was another thing. They had about 20 women to each man in Washington during the war. And that was a joy. But anyhow. <laughs> what was your war experience, your combat experience? Combat in experience, we went over. After we watched the D.C., they sent us to a staging area outside of New York. And we were kept there for a couple of weeks. And then we were all on. Nobody knew how we were going or when we were going. but. I used to go into town with, and see my parents once in a while. They got days off, but all of a sudden they closed us down they, and they loaded us on the Queen Elizabeth, the original Queen Elizabeth, and there were 19,000 troops on there. And we went five days, 
and uh, we landed in the Firth of Clyde in Scotland and took trains down to this little village and it was directly between Cambridge and Newmarket, right in the middle, but a little village. And the airfield was adjoining the village and it was totally camouflaged. They had missing huts with trees. And, uh, they had no runways. They had steel planking, you know, uh -huh. with the grass growing through, you know what I'm talking about? And uh, to give you an example of how well it was camouflaged, on my first flight there, I flew, and it was right on the road between Cambridge and Newmarket, 12 miles, six miles in the middle. I flew over it four or five times and couldn't see the airport. I had to call them and tell them to shoot up a flare. That's, it was really remarkable. Anyhow, we, at the beginning we ran into combat. We were mostly escort, but we ran into combat, mostly ME-109, sometimes FW-190s. <laughs> Over there you were flying the Mustangs already? Or no, Thunderbolts, the Thunderbolts. Thunderbolts. And I loved yeah. the Thunderbolt. Wonderful airplane. And we did strafing and we did dive bombing and skip bombing, if you know, skip it into bridges, convoys, trains. I used to love trains. You know, just blow them up. <laughs> <laughs> but, Was uh, it in France or in France, Germany? Germany, France, Germany, Holland, Belgium, Poland. We went as far as oh, Poland and Poland once. <laughs> that was the longest flight. I think it must have been Mustangs because it was about seven hours. Over, I think it was over seven hours. But it was already with the Mustang. It's Probably. the only airplane that could get the, <coughs> yeah, that far. Before the Mustangs, we, we couldn't get to Berlin even, but we were taking them to Berlin and so on. And um, you didn't get a chance. To, if you were a wingman, which I was, <coughs> pardon me, I was a wingman for the squadron commander. And he knew I was a pretty good pilot. I, I, I say that uh, with modesty. I really was a pretty good pilot. And he knew I was good, and he knew I would protect him. So he wouldn't let me have a group or a squad or nothing. Until he finished flying, then I became a, um, a, leader, a squadron. A, a wing, a leader. A leader, an element leader, and a, yeah, element a flight leader. commander. Yeah. And I had my own flight with eight pilots. And then I was first, by that time, it was towards the end at the Luftwaffe. We used to have a sign over our squadron door where we used to meet. And the, and the sign was, kill the bastards. Kill the bastards, that was the sign. Then, after about six months that we were there, we changed the kill. They crossed it out and they put, find the bastards. Because <laughs> we couldn't find them. They were hot. Really, it was so hard to... We got, rarely ran into them, so we did a lot of, you know, strafing airfields and things to try to get them to come up, and, and I, I did have two destroyed, one crumble, and three damage. That was my total score, but I never really got into... In the early part, when there were a lot of them around, I was a wingman, <laughs> and the wingman's job is to protect his, his leader. But by that time, you, don't, you didn't have the feeling of Jewish guy fighting the Germans because I, you were not I aware did. of... No, I was aware that they hated the Jews and that they were concentration camps, but I wasn't aware of the gas chambers. That came later, after the war. I really wasn't aware. Uh, I'll give you one little study about the Jews. There was plenty of anti-Semitism. There still is in the States and all over the world. What did you do most of your life? Well, uh, after the war, I, I became a civilian instructor, and I taught flying for a while. <sighs> and I got out of the war before the war ended in Japan. Uh, I had a lot of points, and they didn't need pilots, so they, they discharged me, and I got my civilian instructor's rating and started teaching. And I was teaching at a civilian airport, and uh, somebody offered me a job to go to China in 1946, and I decided I had enough flying and uh, I took the job and I went by boat from New York through the Panama Canal to China, a freighter. There were only about eight passengers and I stayed in China only about six months. Uh, so he wanted to open up an office there and uh, I did selling of used clothing and other things and I sold uh, uh, 25,000 uh, heaters, 220 volts I had there. And it was an interesting time, but uh, I told him that the, the guy who hired me was a friend of mine that I knew from childhood, and I had loaned him money to go into business. And uh, I told him that 
it wasn't practical to open an office in China. The communists were coming and they were getting close. It was already 46. The communists took over finally in 48. So I came back and went into business with uh, two, pro there's two brothers that I knew. And the three of us started a little textile business in drapery fabrics. And uh, I went back to school. I studied something about converting and textiles and so on and at night school. And then the war came along in Israel. And after I got back from Israel in 51, I left here in January of 51, I went back to the States and I went in. And I had been forced out by the two brothers of the business. They literally pushed me out, which I wanted to get out anyhow. I, did, I, I realized they were not trustworthy people and uh, I wasn't happy. So I went into my own business and uh, with a partner and bought the partner out shortly after and stayed in business until uh, 1989. I retired. That's it. Quick. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's... Uh... Sunday, November 16th, 2003. We had a wonderful meeting this morning uh, at the Hasharon Hotel, Herzliya, with major, retired <laughs> Israeli Air Force major, yeah. Machal pilot, George Lichter, a fighter pilot in the American Air Force during the Second World War, a fighter pilot, combat pilot in uh, 101, first uh, combat pilot squadron of the Israeli Air Force during the War of Independence, the instructor of the first combat pilots of the Israeli Air Force during this, the uh, War of Independence. Uh, we heard a wonderful, wonderful story um, of, um, of, of, a a your, fine man. of a fine man, of, of uh, an amazing uh, uh, connection. Uh, uh, a tribute to Israel uh, during uh, more than 55 years. It was 50, mm. more than 55 years ago. Mm. Yeah. The, photogra the photographers were uh, Sagi Alush and Liran Dassau. The producer was First Lieutenant Yael Beckstein, my colleague uh, that knows so much about you and uh, the War of Independence, is uh, uh, Reserve Lieutenant Colonel. Ohad Noy, uh, and myself, Avi Moshe Segal. Thank you very, very much, George Lichter. Uh, we uh, hope you're gonna have, you're gonna visit here many more times. Thank and, you. Uh, Israeli Air Force uh, <laughs> escorts you oh. right now. <laughs> That's sweet. I'd like to say one more thing. When, Please do. When, when Ohad talks about I feel that people treat me royally when I come here. And I, I feel, not only for me, but I'm talking about all the other guys, that Israel shouldn't feel a debt to us. We all got so much by coming here. I really feel that way. And that goes for Red Finkel and Mike Flint. And we, we learned about our heritage. We learned about Israel. We, learned, we, we feel grateful to Israel for allowing us the opportunity and and it was wonderful for us and so Israel doesn't owe us I always feel I want to give to Israel not that I want to take from Israel and I thank everybody for being so nice and I appreciate it and that's why I want them to come and visit me once in a while so I can reciprocate long years mm -hmm. very thank good you. health thank you very very much and thank you for coming I appreciate it שלום ולהתראות. תודה רבה. יופי.